Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the first in a series of free webinars that Dell Tech will be offering. And I'd also like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Paula Stanley, and I lead the EHS Consulting Division here at Dell Tech. We offer a wide range of full-service environmental health and safety services, and so many more, including regulatory compliance, product safety, laboratory testing. So if you ever are in need of assistance, please feel free to contact us at any time. The first topic that we've decided to look at with our webinar series is safety in greenhouse production facilities, and we're looking at cannabis and other crops as well. Production facilities have very certain hazards depending on what you're producing, um, and often they're not in other lines of work. With the increase of greenhouse jobs, mainly due to the new cannabis industry and now the legalization of the recreational market, we thought it would be a good topic to start with. The value with creating a safety culture is that you boost morale within your workforce, you retain good workers, you work towards a preventative process, and hopefully in the process, increase productivity and also increase customer satisfaction. So I want to talk a little bit about the safety basics. So it doesn't matter which industry you work in or for, there is basic requirements for each of the provinces and all countries as well. There is a process for due diligence, which is the basis for ensuring your safety programs are in place, working, and being preventative to keep your workers safe. With any system, such as safety or quality, and procedures and outline controls to manage risk and mitigate hazards. The key to your safety program is to manage risk and mitigate hazard in the workplace. The first step in this process is to identify the hazards. For instance, in a greenhouse facility, some common hazards you may encounter are ergonomic hazards, such as lifting potted plants or soil or any sort of large tools or equipment. Um, there can often be heavy equipment operations such as forklifts and sometimes tractors. Uh, people can be using power tools such as clippers uh, to, to trim plants. But there's also the general tools that you could be using as well, such as a drill or hammer. Chemically, there's hazards related to pesticide use. And one of the things that we need to look at, especially in summer months, is heat and fatigue. There are very definitive requirements for a hot work program to protect workers from environmental concerns. Once you have identified your hazards in your workplace, the expectation is that they're rated related to risk. How severe could an accident be? How complex is the task? How often is the task performed? When we look at these things, we often look at human behavior and we look at how strenuous a task is overall. And if someone's performing multiple tasks, we also look at physical demands for that person or job. Regardless of where you are, provincial or country, there's a, a set of required programs. Um, the basics for a safety program, this is not a complete list, but these are the general basic requirements. And the first one is a health and safety policy where you relate your commitment to health and safety um, as well as, you know, who's responsible for health and safety in the workplace. A big one in Canada, the second one, is a workplace violence and harassment policy, program and policy. And this can relate to many different legislation, including um, the human rights legislation or any disability programs that may be in place. Another big part of a health and safety program is understanding your rights and responsibilities in the workplace and also including the hazards in the workplace. In a greenhouse or any other production facility, there's often proper protective equipment required to be worn. 
and a program is required to train employees on how to use it, how to upkeep their equipment, and what to do in the event of a failure. WIMIS in Canada is another one, or HAZCOM in the USA, um, and this is the right to know about workplace hazardous materials. Uh, number six is first aid and emergency procedures, including incident investigation. It's a key to emergency response to make sure you have first aid trained people. Each province and country has requirements for training, as well as the number of people that are required to be trained in your facilities. Another hazardous program that we look at is working alone. You may have someone coming in on the weekend, let's say, to start a sprinkler system or to check on your facility. And this is a really important program because there's no knowing what's going on while that person's there alone. Another key program is the orientation of employees. Introducing employees to the workplace, introducing them to the hazards, and many other items are included in this process. Again, number nine, we look at the use of power tools and mobile equipment. There's a huge push on pedestrian safety at this time. Uh, there's been multiple incidents of people being hit by forklifts and tractor trailers, and often, obviously, due to the mass of the equipment hitting them, it doesn't end well. Another key program that's looked at is lockout and confined space programs. These are very high hazard programs. They require very prescriptive controls. And every legislation that I've ever seen contains a requirement for these if they are present in your workplace. Workplace inspection is also a key program. Um, it's how you look at your facility, how you document what's going on in your facility, any continuous improvement, any safety hazards that may be. It could be as simple as a, uh, a loose bookcase in an office, or it could be some racking in your warehouse that is loose or has a dent in it that creates a hazard. And these are things that should be inspected regularly. Number 12, uh, safety representatives or joint health and safety committee requirements. They may not be called that in your legislation, but the input is the same, and that is to have a representative that's responsible for safety in your facility and that works with employees and the employer to ensure safety within. Another question that's often asked is, when are safe work procedures required? Safe work procedures generally are written to include tasks that have hazardous substances or materials or complicated tasks and the use of machinery. If we go back to the main slide before and think about the use of mobile equipment, there are requires, requirements for licensing, training, and use that have to be documented and trained. Safe work procedures are also written for tasks that are performed um, less frequently. So less frequently performed tasks can cause increased risk because people are not used to doing them and they may not remember the safe way to do work. Once you've identified the hazards and rated the risks in your facility, this will help you to see what programs and controls are required. Again, some examples could be lockout, chemical use. This could include pesticides or cleaning products, ergonomics, pedestrian safety, and mobile equipment operation. The next step in a complete program is the training. In order to ensure that your workers understand the risks and hazards that are involved and the required legislation and training, it's a really important part of what you do. There are many legislated programs, such as WIMIS and the Right to Know. There is also legislated requirements depending on which province and country you're in for things such as being a forklift driver. There are some items that won't specifically be listed in a legal requirements list that also require training, and these will be identified when you complete your hazard identification. Not unlike your quality program, this is where the critical points are identified and controlled. 
It may not say specifically that you require a pedestrian safety plan in your provincial or country legislation, but the fact of the matter is when you take all reasonable precautions, that would be part of the process. It is also important to gauge the transfer of information to employees via competency evaluations, often in the form of a quiz or written response. These are required to be marked um, and feedback given to the employees. There's also an expectation that if someone does not understand based on this competency test, that this will be reviewed with them so that they have a good understanding. Often there's a passing grade mark that's assigned to uh, make sure people retain knowledge as well. It is also really important to remember that everybody learns in different ways. So even if you have an employee that doesn't do well on a quiz, they may be able to verbally tell you all the information that is in the training program. So it's often very important to make sure that you're covering off these things, especially from an accessibility standpoint. So in summary, hazard identification and risk ratings for your workplace are a really important part of setting up your safety program. The controls that come from this risk rating are put in place to ensure safety with work procedures, engineering controls, and can also include substitution and elimination of hazards. There are legislated program requirements, and the training of employees and documented records of knowledge transfer are a huge, important part of your program. And so, um, of course, as a consulting company, we offer a wide variety of services. And in our EHS, we can certainly help with any of the programs listed, um, as well as hazard and risk assessments. So we can offer to help you with your health and safety policies, your violence and harassment programs, your rights and responsibilities, proper protective equipment, including choosing the proper prote protective equipment, with your WIMIS program, first aid and emergency procedures, working alone, orientation, use of power tools and mobile equipment, lockout, tagout, confined space, and many other programs. At this time, I'd also like to introduce our regulatory partnership program. This is a really innovative program that works with you as your source for environmental health and safety information. It helps you to be compliant. It sets you up for success by providing you with the basics of a safety program as far as policies are concerned. Um, and of course, there's ongoing support in the first three to four months, your programs and procedures are completed and put in place. And after this, there's ongoing monthly support. And depending on what kind of business you have, it will depend on what kind of ongoing support you request and require. Some people might like to have a monthly safety meeting with the regulatory partner. Or some people may prefer to have training provided. It's really based on your business needs. As a preferred client in our regulatory partnership program, we offer you an outsourced regulatory team responsible for continuous preparation and implementation of your safety program. Please call us to discuss any of your business needs. A little bit about Deltec. Deltec has been in the business of regulatory compliance for 39 years, and we provide hazard and risk solutions in the areas of environmental health and safety. We work with you, the client, to create and implement compliant, cost-effective solutions usable at all levels that fit the needs of your business and keep people and the environment safe. Have a great day, and I hope you enjoyed this very quick overview of this webinar. <laughs>